السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما رب زدني علما رب زدني علما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا It's a pleasure to be here in your beautiful country this small island where wherever you drive you find water just in a matter of a few minutes uh, and also to see these beautiful faces some of you I saw this morning for Jumu'ah and others I'm seeing for the first time. So to all of you, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And the topic that uh, I had chosen was the life and times or the life and time of Saeed Nursi. The wonder of our times or of the time. The legend of our times or the legend of time in general. Now, there are a lot of different figures, there are a lot of different people, there are a lot of different scholars, there are a lot of different conquerors, there's lots of very important figures within the history of Islam. But oftentimes, when we look at these important figures in the history of Islam, we consider them simply historical figures. That's it. And it becomes hard for us to connect ourselves to the lives of these figures. Why? Because they are a thousand years ago, uh, 1400 years ago. The shaitan tells us all sorts of excuses and says, those were people and they're gone. You're living in a different situation. You're living in a different time. Your situation is a lot different. And for that reason, I thought that to really feel connected to the legends, let's take a look at a legend who happens to be a legend that perhaps our very parents were alive when he was alive. Perhaps our grandparents were going through all of the same trials that, that he went through. Perhaps some of us sitting in this room were alive when this man was also alive and well and doing something for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla. That man, his name is Badi'u Zaman, or rather his laqab, his title is Badi'u Zaman. Saeed ibn Mirza al Nursi al Kurdi al Turki, the Kurdish and the Turkish, right? And he was born in the year 1877. In the eastern part of modern day Turkey, in a small village which was known as Nurs. And this man. At a very young age, he began, he began to, to seek knowledge. And the reason for that was because he saw his brother who was going out of his way after his parents had encouraged him to do so. He was going to learn in a school. And it wasn't something that every single person would be doing. Historically, nowadays we have binding education for 12 years. Everyone has to go through it, right? At that time, that was not necessarily the case. But his brother... He noticed that every time he comes back for the breaks, he notices that he, there's something different about his brother over the rest of the children in the town, right? So that gave him an insight into the fact that studying and education is going to develop something important out of people as it's doing for my brother and naturally for me as well. So from a very young age, he had his direction ready. He wanted to go and he wanted to learn. At the age of nine, he was admitted into those makeshift schools of old and also till today in Africa and other places called al Kutab or Maktab. He was placed in the school. And he tried studying, but it didn't quite work out because he was a person of a very strong demeanor and resolve, okay? And for that reason, he didn't get along with people at school, essentially. So he had to come home. And now, as he's at home, he has to learn. He still wants to learn. So he starts learning with his brother in the breaks. One uh, book after another, one thing after another, the letters, the language, then uh, different uh, Islamic subjects, and so on and so forth. 
Later on, he joins, not to, in his early teens, he joins a school to actually now go through an, a complete study of the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal, to learn Islamic sciences as the scholars of Islam study, as the students of Islam study. And normally, as we know, in most curriculums of Islamic studies, it takes five, six, seven, eight, sometimes even more than that, years to really complete a program, right? Of Islamic sciences. The brothers told me over here, it takes around six years to go through the madrasa curriculum, right? This person, he was so sharp and his memory was almost photographic memory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had gifted him to a degree that in three months, he completed the entire curriculum. To a degree that literally his teacher started to entitle him at the age of 14, he called him Mullah Saeed. No longer was he just called Saeed al Nursi. He was now called Mullah Saeed at a very, very young age, at the age of 14. Okay? Now, of course, there were some things he'd already studied with his brother, as we said, right? But when he got to the actual school, he was able to go through very, very large portions of, in, of information at, in a very short period of time because A, he had very good analytical skills. And B, he had very good memory as well. And one of the signs of this individual's amazing memory was what Mullah Fathullah, he's one of his teachers, writes in his book, in his textbook that he was studying from called Jam'ul Jawami'. Jam'ul Jawami' is a book on Usul al Fiqh, which is normally studied over a course of two or three or more years and divided over different semesters. So, Mullah Saeed, he picked up this book and his teacher says, He ended up memorizing all of this Jam'al Jawami' within one Jumu'ah, i.e. within one week, from a Jumu'ah to another, okay? He memorized all of this, just in that short, brief period of time. Memory, this is something that is, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses people at different junctions in history. And I'll tell you what type of a junction this was. And I'm not picking this topic just because I picked it. I'm picking it very, very carefully. As we need to develop ourselves in more than just hearing about the basics. Of course, there's nothing that we have, we should look down upon within the religion. But our thought needs to be developed. We need to develop our perception of the world. This particular life or this particular individual in his life will really develop your, your perception of the world around you. Because what occurred during this time really affected almost uh, the entire world. Okay, And he was one of the key factors within this entire equation. So because of this, he was given the title, The Wonder of Times, or The Wonder of Time, Badi'u zaman right? Because he was able to memorize so fast and understand. One of the narrations about his life have it, that he was exiled from a city at a very young age, still in his teens, late teens now. And he ended up going to a, uh, a small dome, right? They used to have these zawaya and takaya where people could just simply station themselves to worship Allah Azza wa Jal and there would be, you know, books and so on and so forth. So he stationed himself in one of the, such places and he found himself a copy of Al-Qamus Al-Muhid, the dictionary, one of the Arabic dictionaries, old dictionary from the 8th, 9th century perhaps. He memorized the dictionary from the beginning till the chapter of Seen. Alif Ba and all the way down to a scene. He memorized it within a matter of three months. So this is exceptional memory, okay? And of course, in addition to that, over his travels and so on and so forth, he ended up picking up uh, 90 different odd books that he committed to memory in addition to the dozens if not hundreds that he had read. This is a little bit about his early education, okay? Or a little bit about his education in general. One of the things that we're going to notice throughout his life is that he has three qualities which are unique about him, which can be seen at every junction in his life. 
The first one is patience. He's going to go through trials after trials after trials after trials, but he will remain patient. And another one is truthfulness. He will always stay true to his message that he believes to be his message. And the third one is sincerity. And even when he is going to, we'll see as he's trying to look at the world around him and make sense of why Muslims are going through these trying and difficult times. What are those trying and difficult times? I'll be speaking about that as well in a very, very short period of time. Anyways, after his early education, he moved out to out of Kurdistan, right? He was in the eastern part of modern day Turkey, which is also used to be called Kurdistan, right? He moved out of there. He moved to the city of Mardin, and then he moved to a number of different cities, which is slightly north of uh, Syria. And uh, now he's exposing himself to the outside world, right? Now he's understanding really what the Western influences, the European influences, what they are doing to the rest of the Ottoman Empire, not his particular location where he had come from, but the rest of the, the world. Now he's starting to debate with people who are non-Muslims. Now he's starting to discuss and converse with people who have been afflicted by modern philosophies and theologies and so on and so forth, things he had never seen before. But of course he's well equipped with the Qur'an committed to his memory, 90 odd books committed to his memory, a very sharp mind to begin with, analytical skills and so on and so forth. So he's able to gather a lot of this information, make sense of it and correct it in the wisest of ways. He moves from a city to another, to another and to another. Until he finally, uh, or one of the cities that he stations himself at, is the city of Van in the year 1897, okay, 1897, so he's around 20 years of age now. And during this period of stay in this new city that he's in, he has been given the privilege of being, uh, a, having access to the house of the governor. There, there's a big library. So he goes and benefits from this library. But in this library, there happens to be books which are imported from uh, Britain, which are imported from other parts of Europe, from France, and so on and so forth, which are also in Turkish. Remember, he is Kurdish, so he doesn't quite understand Turkish at that time. Now, it's a unified language, and Kurdish have their own language as well. But at that time, he didn't understand Turkish. So he had to learn Turkish as a second language, because he realized that in the rest of the Ottoman Empire, this is the language in order for me to survive, I'll have to learn it. Now with his sort of mind, very, very fast, he picked up the language. He's reading, he's learning, he's interacting with this information. And as he's interacting with this information, he comes to some very, very key realizations. He re comes to a realization that, listen, I and my people, I and Muslims in general, whether that be in, in where I came from, Eastern uh, Turkey, Anatolia, or whether that be in other parts of the Muslim world, we are only acquainted to spiritual sciences. We are only acquainted to logic that is of old. We are only acquainted to our own legacy. This new science and this new knowledge that is coming, it's going to sweep away everything from our lands. That's a realization he came to through reading these new books that he was coming across. He came to this realization and he said the only way for us to be able to maintain our legacy, for us to be able to maintain our countries, our influence, our power, and so on and so forth, is that we have to somehow unify these two different things. We have to harmonize modern sciences and we have to ha harmonize Islamic knowledge. Now at that time, this idea of harmonizing modern sciences and harmonizing uh, the sciences of, uh, of modern day and Islamic sciences, that was an idea that was something that was coming to a lot of different minds, okay? Not too long after that, it also came to the mind of a man by the name of Muhammad al-Tahir ibn Ashu. And of Tunisia. It came to his mind as well. And he tried to 
revolutionized the educational system of his own country as well. So he says, I have, he's around 30 years of age now. He moves to Istanbul. He knows that the location that he's in, there's not much money, there's not much wealth, it's not the center of the caliphate, it's none of that. I'm not really going to be able to do anything over here. So he moves himself to Istanbul. When he gets to Istanbul, he realizes that the only way he can show people the type of knowledge and turn people's attention to the type of knowledge that people are seeking in the eastern part of, the modern, of modern day Turkey is by him showing his knowledge to people. So he decides to meet the key scholars of that city, one after another. They meet him, they debate him, they test him. And every, at every junction, he is considered more superb than they thought. They'd already heard of him because he was called Badi'u al-Zaman, the wonder of time. But they thought to themselves that we are the city people, we have had knowledge and sciences, and we've had you know, uh, interactions with, all over the, with, with people from all over the world. What is this chap going to know, right? Even if it's called Badi'u al-Zaman. But soon after, they realized that this man is really the wonder of time. One of the great scholars from Egypt, from Al-Azhar met him and he said to him, what do you think, O Badi'u al-Zaman, what do you say about Europe and the Ottomans? What do you say about these two different civilizations? What are your thoughts? What do you have to say? He said to him that Europe is pregnant with Islam and one day it will give birth. And he says the Ottomans are pregnant with Europeanism, and one day they are going to give birth as well. Now, this Egyptian scholar, he stopped and he said, I had the same idea that you're presenting, this is exactly what I thought about the future as well. This is what I predicted as well, that slowly but surely, Islam is going to rise and spread in Europe. That's something that I thought as well. And I also thought that because of the way the Ottomans are treating the European civilization, they are going to come to a fall as well. But I could never ever, with such consciousness and such pre precision, capture this. This person that is saying this must in fact be Badi'u al-Zaman. And he, had, he affirmed to this title of Badi'u al-Zaman, Saeed al-Nursi. And we see that the, one of the two parts of this particular claim of Badi'u al-Zaman, this prediction of but the Uzzaman actually came true. How did it come true? Some of that, insha'Allah ta'ala, we will discuss uh, soon, insha'Allah ta'ala. Now, after he stayed in Istanbul, the idea was he wanted to get funding. Funding for what? He wanted to get funding for this school that he had thought of. He had thought that there needs to be a way to harmonize human sciences and Islamic sciences. How to do that? Well, we need to have fun. Funds, right? Where to get the funds? The caliphate, the awqaf, the endowments, everything happens to be in Istanbul. That's where we're going to get the funds. So he goes there to try to gather the funds, but nothing comes through. And sadly, he has to leave and he travels to a number of different cities. Finally, he finds himself at a place called Damascus, which is no mystery to all of you. Okay? He travels down south to Damascus. In Damascus, he makes an address. This address became extremely powerful, extremely well known at that time until today. It was known and it continues to be known as the Damascus Sermon or the Al Khutbah Al Shamiya or Al Khutbah Al Dimashqiya, the Damascus Sermon. Okay? He gave this sermon in Al Jami' Al Umawi. And in this sermon, He's going to now paint his own life. He's going to define the points that he realizes are points of weakness within the ummah. And through that, he's going to be able to define exactly what he wants to do with his own life. And from this we can take, my dear brother, my dear sister, that we have to define what we want to do with our lives. The faster you can come to a conclusion on what is it that, there, that the society truly needs, the faster you'll be able to fill a gap within society. This man, at this age, at this turn in his life, he's just above 30, probably 33 years of age, 34 years of age. 
he's able to define what are the major problems within the ummah that is slowing the ummah down. And as I said, at this time, the ummah is going through a, a very tough time. I'm going to describe that in great detail today, insha'Allah ta'ala. Things that perhaps you never heard of. Perhaps your forefathers, even your, your, your direct parents may not have heard of as well. Maybe your grandparents heard of this. Okay? I'll describe this in great detail. The reason why I want to describe this in great detail is because those same trends that we saw about a hundred years ago, they are also coming today as well and we're seeing it in different places in the world today as well. Okay? So anyways, he looks at these situations and he says that there are six problems in the ummah, six major problems in the ummah. The first problem is disparity. That people despair. That there is no more hope within the minds of Muslims. When they see the situation of Muslims, they just go into disparity and there's no more hope left. And we know that the Messenger وسلم, said that Al Imanu Bain al Khawfi wa Raja. The true belief lies between khawf, fear, and also hope as well. So the only way we can continue our our mission as Muslims and accomplish it is if we have hope within Allah Azza wa Jal. If we continue to allow this hope to, to be nourished within our bodies through positivity. So he says, disparity is everywhere. Every time he speaks to a Muslim in any part of the world, and he's a very well-traveled man by the way, there's disparity, okay? Then he says, the second thing he says, is that there is a death of truth. Literally, truth has died at the social level and at the political level. Those are the two things he points out. That when we speak to people in our communities, we find that it is hard to find a truthful person. And that when we speak to our politics, there's also a difficulty to find politics who are telling, politicians who are telling the truth. Okay? So there's a death of truth. Then there is a there is a love of hatred, right? And sometimes we find this love of hatred has also taken a religious sort of twist to it. People give hatred a, r a religious twist. People hate the other, whatever that other may be for you. People he hate anything they don't know. You know, المرء عدو ما يجهل That the individual is the enemy of something he's ignorant of. So anything we don't know, we, we naturally hate it, okay? Or we're naturally afraid of it and we hate it as well. And we have animosity towards it. And sometimes groups, right? At every turn in every community, and alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, I have had the opportunity to briefly travel around the world. And I must say that I have never been to a community, okay? Except that the people of that community, one of the things that they tell me is, Shaykh, our community is different. There's a lot of division here. No, it's not. This happens to be all around the world. Because there's this institutionalized version of hate, right? If a person is slightly different than us, we say khalas. This person is off of our methodology and that means that we have to change our attitude and behavior towards him. So he says, this is one of the problems with the ummah. Love of hatred. Then he says there is another problem and that's number four if you're taking notes, that there is an ignorance of the divine connection between brothers and the brotherhood that we're supposed to have with one another. Number five, he says, and the way to fix that is to teach and preach brotherhood by our actions, by the way we treat each other, by the way we, even things we say, even the rhetoric that we use to speak about the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal. Hatred is not something that is Islamic and we really don't have time for it today. Wallahi, we do not. And he goes and continues and he says number five is authoritarianism and dictatorship. And that is something that we see around the Muslim world today. Okay? Authoritarianism continues till today. He argues and he says, and Wallahi, rightfully so. He says that a believer should not be humiliated nor should he humiliate, have to humiliate himself before people. Because a believer at the end of the day is only a slave of Allah Azza wa Jal. 
So the authoritarianism, it actually leads to a lot of different other ills within society as well. And there are reasons why it exists as well, but that's a long topic on its own. Then he says, number six, that the focus on personal benefit. Everybody is worried about themselves. Nobody's worried about the community around them. And also the people in one community are not worried about the one that is beyond them as well. And that community is not worried about the... So the people in the village are not worried about the people in the grander city and the people in the city are not worried about the country and the people in the country are not worried about the global community. But we have to be worried about the global community. We have to be worried about the people that are within our country. We have to be worried about the people who are within our own cities and villages as well. And within our own households as well. Instead of just being focused on me, my, self and I. And then he, you know, proposes solutions for this. And I encourage that you go read the sermon. It's translated into Arabic, into English, and it's available. It was essentially written in Arabic. Most of his works are in Turkish. But some of them are also in Arabic as well. Anyways, all of it, most of it, if, if not all of it, has been translated into both Arabic and English. So it's available uh, in either case. After this, Al Khutbah Shamiya, he returns back to Istanbul. This time, he is a bit more acclaimed. This time, he is a bit older as well. So people are going to take him more seriously. This time he is more established. He gave this khutbah as shamiyah that became known around the world because 10,000 people attended this khutbah. And out of those 10,000 people, there was 100 scholars that were sitting before him listening to the khutbah that he had given. That's why I said, this is a very important khutbah which is imprint and it's available uh, and you should go and read, read and benefit from it. And then he returns, as I said, to Istanbul. Again, with the dream that he wants to build the school. A school which he's going to call Madrasat al Zahra, the school of al Zahra. Why? He wanted to call it al Zahra from the word Azhar. Okay? So, as there is Jami'at al Azhar or al Jami'at al Azhar, he wanted to make al Madrasat al Zahra. Right? In which there will be human sciences and Islamic sciences harmonized together. This time around, he was a bit more lucky. He gets the opportunity to get the donation he really needed. He gets 15,000 gold coins from the Sultan. And he and the, the Ottoman Empire, the Khalifa, the Caliph, the Sultan rather, he ended up commissioning for him the construction of the school in eastern Anatolia in the eastern regions of of Turkey and the school starts now it, the foundations of the school is now being laid down in the city of Van and as the foundations are being laid down he doesn't want to delay now he has funds as well so he starts the classes as well in a temporary location as the classes are going on however this is now around 1915. As the classes are going on, around that time, we also have another problem in the world, and that is World War I. Okay? So, World War I now starts to affect the Ottoman regions. And there is an invasion that he himself tries to protect his villages from by going out to resist this particular uh, Russian invasion of the Ottoman territories. And he takes his students along with him. So they're fighting in this particular front to try to protect the villages that are behind them. And as he is doing all of this, he recalls something that happened in one of his previous stays in one of the other, one of the cities, city of Van as well, where he had stayed uh, prior to that. He remembers something that happened that had painted the picture also for his life on what he wants to do and what he should be doing. What was that? He had read a... He was reading a lot at that time, Western and Eastern knowledge now, right? So he had read a statement in whatever, one of the books or one of the newspapers that he was reading by Sir William Gladstone. He had read that 
This individual had said, so long as there is the book of Allah, the Qur'an, he didn't say book of Allah, he said the book, right? So long as there is the Qur'an or the book existing in the hands of Muslims, there will be no peace in the world. We will never be able to dominate them. We should find a way to take this Qur'an from their hands and do as much as possible to remove the Qur'an from being central to the life of Muslims. And alienate them to this Qur'an as best possible. Okay, this book as best possible. So he pointed out that the primary problem and the primary reason why the British are not able to conquer the Ottomans is the Qur'an. Okay? When Badi'u al-Zaman Sa'id al-Nursi, he read this, these words, he said to himself, I will demonstrate, I will show and prove to the world that the Qur'an is such an undying and inextinguishable sun. A sun which does not become extinguished. And that's exactly what he did within his life as we'll find out very, very soon. So he remembers this incident as he is in battle, literally as he's in battle. And as he's on top of his horse, on the front row, in the battlefield, in the trenches, the enemy is in front of him. He tells one of his students to take out a piece of paper on the horse, they're still on the horse, start writing. And as they're on the horse, from his memory, he starts writing his tafsir, called Isharatul Ijaz. And he literally wrote the first volume, and the only volume of that tafsir, later he's gonna write other things, of that tafsir, on top of the horse in battle. From his mind, all of it from his memory. Because as we said, he had a very sharp memory. Because he was afraid, he thought to himself that if I die, I'm not going to be able to accomplish it. At least I can start. Maybe Allah will give me the reward of, of, of you know, having the, a good intention, right? So he's able to accomplish a very, very beautiful volume on top of his horse whilst, you know, whilst he's still uh, in, in the fight. And this volume, I have a copy of it within my house as well. I have, alhamdulillah, most of his books as well. And then as they're going through this battle, as the story goes, the Russians are able to infiltrate one of the camps of the Ottomans and they end up arresting a lot of the army. Okay? One of the people that gets arrested is Badi'u al-Zaman Sa'id al-Nursi. They take them and they send them to Siberia. And now he's in Siberia in the middle of literally nowhere in cold, freezing weather. And as he's there, he is inside of a prison, a very major official from the prison, a very senior official shows up. And everyone stands, all the prisoners stand out of respect for this senior official. But Badi'u Zaman does not stand. He does not stand, he's sitting in a spot. So the senior official asks him, why don't you stand? He says, I am a scholar of Islam. And if I stand to you, then I will be disrespecting the knowledge that I have, which is a greater status than the seniority that you have. And he's inside of the prison. So they say, obviously they say, and now we're, we're dealing with the you know, early Russians. Even now, it's not all that, but think about it then. So they said, khalas, this person is going to be executed. So they make an order to execute Badi'u Zaman Sa'id al Nursi. And he is about to be executed. As the executioner is there to execute Badi'u Zaman, the senior official, the officer, he says, Do you have something else that you would like to ask before you die? He says, I want to pray salah before I die. So he goes and prays salah. And when he sees the type of salah, with the type of tranquility, with the beauty that he prayed his prayer with, he realized that indeed of a surety, Badi'u Zaman was not trying to disrespect him, rather he was really trying to respect himself. So he said to him, I, he apologized to him, the senior uh, officer, and he said to him, I understand now that you weren't trying to disrespect me, you were only trying to respect yourself. And that raised 
the status of Badi'u Zaman in the eyes of this officer and he told the executioner, stop, no execution. He remained there in prison for a few years, for two or three years, two and a half years. And then around that time, the communist revolution of Russia started. And during this time, he found an opportunity to escape from prison. So he literally ran away from prison. He escaped and coming through Siberia and many different cities all the way, finally he found his way to Istanbul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how that journey would have been. But this was a person of resolve. When he got to Istanbul, the people greeted him in a whole different way this time, even greater than his first two visits, because now he is a state hero as well. He tried to protect the lands in the eastern side from occupation, then he became arrested, and then he was able to find his way back to his home country as well. So the people, the officials, the government, the ulama, the regular people, everybody started now to look up to this man by the name of Badi'u Zaman, Saeed al-Nursi. So what did they do now? They made him a member of Darul Hikmah. Darul Hikmah was a research wing of something similar to Darul Ifta of that time. Okay? So they made him a member, a, fa a founding member. And as he is doing his duties, performing his duties at Darul Hikmah and Islamiyah, he is addressed with letters from the Anglican Christians, he's addressed with letters from all sorts of people, and he is a person who is confident about his religion, so he answers with confidence. He's a man who understands Eastern and Western sciences because he's read into both of them. So he, he answers in a way where people are convinced. So many people really started to become irritated with this man. To add to this, to add fuel to this fire, at this time we had within the Ottoman Empire and occupation as well and invasions after invasions and so on and so forth and he became at the forefront of ulama of scholars who would raise their voices against this occupation okay to a degree that a fatwa had come from the office of Shaykh al-Islam what does Shaykh al-Islam mean? in the Ottoman Empire it means the top authority literally okay they had a, they had a legal role an official role of Shaykh al-Islam the last of the Shaykh al-Islam in the Ottoman Empire was Mustafa Sabri okay so an order came from the official office of Shaykh al-Islam and that particular fatwa had it that, that fighting against these occupations is not legal. Okay? However, he did not abide by this fatwa. He wrote his counter fatwa and he was much more famous at that time. So his counter fatwa spread like wildfire even though he was legally under Shaykh al-Islam. Right? He writes a counter fatwa in which he says it's a necessity for us to resist occupation. This is our country, not their country. So we have to resist occupation. And, and so people continue to resist. And the British, they, uh, they made an order that this person needs to be shot dead upon sight. Okay? But they were unable to do that. Anyways, around this time, whether he, he tried to resist or not, Slowly but surely, the caliphate had weakened to a degree that it finally uh, fell in the year 1924. Now there is no more caliphate, right? There's a long story of how that happened and what occurred, but that's a different subject. Anyways, it fell. Once it did fall, the Turkish people had founded a republic, which stands still today, known as the Republic of Turkey. And essentially when this particular republic was founded, people realized the influence of Saeed al-Nursi, even though he was an Islamic personality, so to speak. And the government is a totally secularist government. But they realized everybody over here is Muslim, we need to have some sort of Muslim influence along with us to legitimize our existence, our, you know, uh, our government. So they tried to have him coordinate with them. He came to Ankara and he gave a lecture in the parliament. And in this lecture that he gave in the parliament, he lectured 
the par parliamentarians about the fact that this country needs to be an Islamic country. It's not going to be a country that is a secular country. It has to be a country that is a country that abides by Sharia. That, and then he also realized as he is with all these people that they're not even praying Salah. So he wrote a treatise at that time, a book at that time in which he called people to pray Salah. And this was such a powerful and strong treatise that literally some of these secular, par secular parliamentarians, they got affected by his words and they started to pray Salah. And at this point, with all of these movements of Badi'u zaman Mustafa Kamal, who named himself Ataturk, and who didn't want to be called Mustafa, because Mustafa is name, the name of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even though that was his name, he didn't want to be called Mustafa Kamal. He just wanted to be called Kamal, perfection, right? After whom all of the people who adopted his ideology till today, the people that are known as Kamalists, okay? They're, 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 they're attributed uh, towards this individual. Mustafa Kamal, he slowly but surely became really annoyed, enraged, angered by this Badi'u zaman People are always talking about Badi'u zaman this wonder of times and so on and so forth. He's thirsty for power. He wants to establish his new republic that he has established. So he started to make the life of Badi'u zaman difficult. Anyways, Badi'u zaman had no interest in politics at this point. Because he realized before he had interests in politics. Because it was a Muslim country, it was a caliphate, and he was trying to protect it from a fall. But now he had no interests left in politics anymore. And he even said a famous statement of his, which goes as such, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ والسياسة. I seek refuge in Allah from Satan and from politics. So now he ended up going uh, <coughs> away from Ankara, and he settled down in caves and different places, uh, to really ponder life and think about uh, his life and so on and so forth. And this is the time where he started to write what, what we know as Rasailun Nur. The treaties or the letters or the pamphlets, if you want to call, of a Nur, of light. Okay? One after another. He wrote these treaties and pamphlets trying to protect the Islam of the Muslims in that time. And I told you, I'll tell you of the difficulties that the Muslims went through. Now, pay very close attention. I've collected these, and I'm going to literally read them out to you by the dates as well. So you understand with chronolo chronology what happened after the fall of the Caliphate, okay? Because till today, some people happen to be under this delusion that secularism will bring ease to life. Secularism will bring all sorts of comforts and so on and so forth. The Ottoman Empire used to host people from France. They were allowed to come and remain there. The Ottoman Empire used to host people that were from, uh, that, were, that were Jewish, Christians, all sorts of religions, right? That remained within the shelter of the Ottoman Empires without any difficulty. Now a secularist ideology comes in and they want to destroy religion from its very roots. So they go and they begin. Remember, 1924 is the fall. So, 1924, the fall of the Caliphate happens, and on March 3rd, 1924, the Caliphate is completely abolished, and all of the Ottomans, what does that mean? The people who are the, the ruling progeny, okay? All of them are exiled from Turkey. The new Republic of Turkey does not host anyone from the Ottoman Empire. Later on, much later, and even now, especially during this phase, uh, that is a phase, you know, that is totally opposite to what Turkey was founded on. But it's a good phase, alhamdulillah. It's a phase of justice. And at this point, all of the Ottomans have been exiled. As I said, some of them have now returned, their progenies at least, whoever, uh, you know, could return. Some of, and some of them are not, haven't returned as well, but many of them have now returned back to uh, Turkey as well, but they were exiled in 1924. They lived through very tough circumstances. I've watched documentaries of uh, grandchildren of the Ottoman uh, emperors and so on and so forth talking about their experiences 
and how people used to look at them as traitors in Syria, in Lebanon, and so on and so forth, and the difficulties that they went through. But it wasn't their fault that all this was happening, right? But it was definitely happening. On March 16th, 1924, the same year, just a few days later, 13 odd days later, all curriculums in the country were unified, all of them, okay? Why did this unification of the curriculums occur? Because when they cancel something, they can cancel it across the board in the entire country. So they unify the curriculums and they cancel Islamic studies and they cancel Quran through in all of the curriculums across the country. Okay? In March 16th, 1924. On April 14th, 1924 as well, the very next month, the Ministry of Endowments and the religious affairs and the Sharia courts are all closed down. Okay? So you don't have endowments to make masjids and maintain masjids. You don't have uh, Sharia courts. You don't have religious authorities. Everything of such nature has now been clo closed down. This is the very, very first year. On March 6, 1925, tens of newspapers which are reporting this information of the closure of the Ministry of Endowments, the Religious Affairs, the Sharia Courts, all of them are also being closed down. Why? Because they don't want any opposition. Okay? This is the secularism that, that was being pushed by the Western world onto the Muslim world uh, during this time. And embraced by some. Some people who didn't quite understand the reality of what secularism is. And then on June 9th, 1925, there was a revolution or an attempted revolution by another Sheikh Saeed, not Sheikh Saeed, uh, not uh, Mullah Saeed, another Saeed. And this one here, however, was a revolution which was an armed revolution. Remember, Saeed al Nursi, he said, no more, no more arms, no more politics, no more, none of that, right? At the junction of the fall of the Caliphate, he stopped all of that. He realized that the only way for us to revive Islam now is to make faith-based communities. Okay? That's the only way. So Saeed, the other Sheikh Saeed Bayran, he asked Mullah Saeed that, would you like to join me? Because Saeed and Nursi has a big following. He refused. He said, this is not how we're going to bring back Islam within our country. Rather, I do not dare to raise uh, a revolution that is going to lead to a lot of bloodshed within our country, okay? Within the Muslim Ummah. So this particular rev revolution was uh, very soon shot down by the government. And, uh, uh, but, but what happened was that Saeed and Nursi, he also got caught up in this because the government started accusing Saeed and Nursi to be involved in this as well. So they brought him to court. Anyways, he went through a lot of court hearings and, and jail sentences and so on and so forth. 23 different jail sentences throughout his life for the sake of reviving Islam. But as you see, he's not actually a political activist, especially after the caliphate fell. Okay? Before that, he had a legal role within the government. After that, he... He, he, he did not go for political activism for reasons which I will explain insha'Allah ta'ala very soon. But in all cases, in 1925, on June 29th, along with this revolution, after the revolution was shot, shot down by the government, they closed down all the takayas. Okay? And they closed down all the zawayas. I, I used this word earlier as well. Takaya or takiya or zawaya or zawiya are basically Islamic centers, if you want to call them, okay? Z Zawiya is normally a term associated with Sufism, where, you know, perhaps a Sufi sheikh resides or something like that, and he addresses his pupils and students. And Takiya is not really that different. So they closed down all of the Zawiya and all of the Takaya. Basically, all Islamic centers prior to this, they've closed down all of the ministries and Sharia courts and everything else. But in 1925, they do this. In 1925 also, on July 25th, 
the Rumi calendar. The Rumi calendar. Does anybody know what the Rumi calendar is? The Rumi calendar is basically the Hijri calendar, only it's not the sol lunar, it's the solar Hijri calendar. Okay? The Rumi calendar is switched for the Gregorian calendar. It's the same thing as the Gregorian calendar in that they're both solar, but the difference is that the Rumi calendar starts with the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. Based on the Rumi calendar, we're around 1396, I believe. Okay? So today, now, so he, they switched the Rumi calendar, which was introduced by the Ottomans, to solve the problem of the lunar, lunar calendar, because one of the problems with the lunar calendar is if you pre-plan, the dates can actually change, right? Considering the fact that it's based on the birth of the moon. So they said, okay, we'll go by the Hijri, but we'll make our own calendar, and they called it this Rumi calendar, okay? It was switched. For what? For the Gregorian calendar. In, on September 4th, 1925, Muslim women were now allowed to take part in uh, dance parties and all of these sort of things. Clubs will slowly start opening up and, and these sort of things. So Fahisha is now on a rise because religion is being suppressed at a government level. Okay? On December 8th, 1925, the European clothes were legislated to be the clothes of the land. No longer did you have that Ottoman shalwar and the, uh, and the imama, right? Now you had a, a different sort of wear, and that is the European dresses, the, the, the blazers and the, the shirts and the pants and the suits, and also that European hat as well, okay? So that was also considered a legislated hat, meaning that this is what your, this is the dress of our country now. And within the same very year, all of the religious titles were cancelled. No longer could people be called Sheikh. Okay? It was illegal to refer to someone now as Sheikh. Sufi titles were cancelled as well. No longer could a person be called a Khalifa if it was part of a Sufi order. Or no longer could a, a, a pupil be called a Murid if he was part of the Sufi order as well. So all of these titles are it's anything Islamic. Basically, they're trying to close it uh, from the very, very roots. On February 17th, 1926, the Islamic nikah is cancelled as well. And it's re re replaced with the civil marriage. What this meant is that there's no such thing as polygamy, that the men don't have to give dowry to women, that the husbands don't hold the right to divorce their wives, and that women are allowed to marry men from any religious backgrounds. Okay, This is two years after the fall of the Caliphate. So there's a deliberate attempt to destroy anything Islamic so that Islam is uprooted from its very, very roots. Okay. Also, the inherent, inheritance law is changed as well. So men and women are made equal. Inheritance law generally is replaced. The Islamic inheritance law is replaced for a modern law that was copied from the Swiss and the Italian law. And on October 4th, by the way, when I say some of these things are happening, if you follow the news, some of these things are happening today in some countries. Some of these things are happening. If you're following the news, the, the inheritance law changing, it happened in Algeria recently, the nikah the system being changed for civil marriages, that's also something that happened in Algeria. You know, people going from a conservative society to dances, uh, you know, women dancing in streets, all of these things are happening. This is why I say this is a very, very relevant topic to what is happening in the Ummah today. Okay? On October 4th, 1926, the European law, namely the Swiss and Italian law, is translated into Turkish and the Turkish law is fully optimized uh, into these two different laws. On October 4th, 1926, for the next 14 odd years, you'll see destruction of religion after one thing after another after another. On October 4th, 1926, the statue of Mustafa Kemal is erected in, in Istanbul, okay? As a sign of liberation, secularization, and in retrospect, all, retrospect, also destruction of religion. 
in, uh, modern Tur- in modern Turkey. But as I said, much of that has been corrected, especially by the most recent government in Turkey. And on May 20th, by the way, I've never been to Turkey. But I want to say something, that even t- till today, some people continue to fall into propaganda that is created by other countries to try to demonize the, uh, the current administration in that country. And I have no real business in that country for me to protect you know, their current administration. But what I want you to think is, this was the state, and now there's a state where a new Islamic university is to be founded in two years from today, okay, which is being constructed right now. So the change requires time. We can't, you know, expect people to make all the changes in the world overnight. Even these things, they took at least um, 16 or plus years for all of these things to happen, for, for the Ottoman Caliphate to totally be abolished and all of the rem- remains of Islam and Muslims to be totally sidelined. It took a long time even for the secularists. So even for Islam to rise in a place, you need to let people breathe and it has to happen slowly. Right? So on May 20th, 1927, all signboards that alluded to anything, 1927 now, all signboards that alluded to anything Ottoman were taken down. All official paperwork was now done through the government of the Republic uh, of the People's Party in Ankara. And on April 10th, April 10th, actually February 3rd, 1928, so we were in 1927, signboards are taken down. 1928, the very first khutbah goes from Arabic now to Turkish because there's also now an attempt to disconnect people from the Arabic language. Why? Because what Sir William said earlier on, we need to disconnect these people from what? The Quran. How do we do that? By disconnecting them from their language, which is the language of the Quran. Arabic was, even though Turkish was a spoken language, Arabic was the what was a language that would that people would study. So most people would know Arabic just as most of us know English today, even though we have other languages as well that we speak. So April 10th, 1928 as well, a few months after the Turkish khutbah, the first Turkish khutbah to be delivered. Now what happens is that the word Allah is no longer used in official oaths. So you can't say, Wallahi, uqsimu billahi, and so on and so forth when you're taking an official oath in a government position. Furthermore, everything related to Islam from the constitution is taken out. Everything. Okay? The fact that the state religion is Islam, that is also taken out. Any signs of Islam within the constitution is now out of there, meaning now it is a completely secular country. Okay? On May 24th, 1928, the Arabic numbers are replaced, the Arabic numbers, right, are replaced for the, for the Western numbers, right, which all of it is really taken from the uh, Indian numbers, right, and they went to Arabic and then the Europeans took it from the Arabs, so essentially the Europeans took it from the Arabs and then those languages that used to write in Arabic uh, fonts they ended up switching to the Europeans, okay? So now this is all part of westernization. Get rid of even the Arabic numbers. Not long after, the Arabic language, the Arabic letters will also be taken. But let's continue in chronology. On November 1st, 1928, the number of mosque employees, because there's endowments that have lots of money, even if they're closed down, they still have payments that are being made to these people for years. The employees of the mosques have now been, have decreased from 2,128 employees across the country to simply 188 employees. On the same date, the Turkish Arabic alphabets, so just a few months after the the, the, the numbers are changed, just a few months after that, the Turkish Arabic alphabets are replaced now for the modern, what they thought was the modern Latin alphabets. All of these things are being done, why? Because when you disconnect a people from the ability to read what they used to write for centuries, they get disconnected from their, their forefathers, right? So now someone that 
would read Turkey, Turkish, the children, especially the growing generation, they will not be able to read the Arabic script because it will soon be banned, illegal. Even if you have a personal preference to write by the Arabic script, you're not allowed to, it's legal. Okay? So what happened because of this? It's illegal Arabic books and Turkish books which were written with the Arabic script. They were sold for very, very cheap prices. Tons and tons. And what I mean by tons? Literally tons. Right? Uh, in terms of weight. Tons and tons of uh, Arabic books were picked up and sold for pennies. Why? Because you couldn't use them. Or they were recycled to be reprint, you know, to print uh, new books and uh, for the paper to be used towards uh, new Latin script, whatever they wanted to print after that. Stores, newspapers, street signs, everything was changed into this Latin script of Turkish, right? December 30th on the in the same year, 1928. Most of the mosques in Istanbul are closed down. There are now only 90 mosques remaining at this date uh, in Istanbul. Next year, September 1st, 1929, all Arabic, all Persian, everything related to Arabic and Persian, religion is already gone. But because books are all around the country, if you teach Arabic and Persian, then you have a problem as well, right? So Arabic and Persian lessons are now closed down. Why? Persian has a lot of ilm in it as well. So Persian is no longer taught, Arabic is no longer taught, and reading Quran, this is only five years after the fall of the Caliphate. Reading Qur'an, reading Islamic books is illegal and the punishments are very harsh, including execution, jail times, all sorts of things. Okay? You're not allowed to read Qur'an. You're not allowed to have a Qur'an. You're not allowed to read Islamic books. You're not allowed to do any of these things. Five years. This is secularism that, that, uh, that some people, for some reason, still continue to be in a mirage that secularism is going to bring. Khair to this ummah, right? January 22nd, 1932, I skipped a few years. The Qur'an was still recited in the mosques because there's still mosques, but people, general people are not allowed to read the Qur'an. However, now the Qur'an is, they've attempted now to switch the Qur'an to Turkish as well. Why does it have to be an Arabic Qur'an if everything is Turkish? The translation of the Qur'an should be recited they also attempted to make that so in Salah. You're not allowed to recite Arabic Qur'an. You can only recite Turkish Qur'an in Salah, right? And on in February 6th, 1932, the khutbah in Jami' al-Sulaymaniya, which if you want to open your phones, you can take a moment and look at Sulaymaniya and look at the picture of it as well. The khutbah now... It reaches that even in Jami'a Sulaymaniyah, the khutbah will no longer be in Arabic, it will be in Turkish as well. On July 18th, 1932, the Adhan and the Iqama were both changed to Turkish and it was illegal for a person to give Adhan in, any, uh, in Arabic. Okay, the regular Adhan that we're so used to, it was, un, it was unlawful based on their laws to give this Adhan in Arabic. And at this junction, of course, people were really, really angry and really mad. So a revolution was attempted in certain parts of Turkey to try to stop this, but again, it was suppressed very, very fast. And uh, this westernization or this secularization or this destruction of Islam, whatever you want to call it, Islamophobia, whatever you want to call it, all of this was still taking place. And as it continued, the Turkish women were now allowed to take part in beauty pageants in 1932 as well. In fact, the international beauty pageant in 1932 was won by a Turkish uh, woman. The reason why I'm mentioning these facts is because all of this shows you an insight into the type of fahisha. If you look at some of the p pictures of women from the Ottoman Empire, you know, even paintings or pictures early pictures from that time, you'll see the type of hijab and jilbab that these women are wearing. Now they're forced to take their clothes off firstly, okay? They're not allowed to wear hijab. They're not, and men are not allowed to wear imamas and they're not allowed to dress 
in anything that shows any Islam to it or even any Turkishness to it, not even Islam. Anything that is Turkish as well because it all has to be like Europe entirely. And in 1932, as I said, the beauty pageant was won by, uh, by this Turkish woman, uh, which again, all of it shows the fact that the akhlaq had slowly but surely decreased to that level where, and you know the type of dress that normally beauty pageants uh, host. In 1933, the revolution occurred against the ban of the Adhan in Arabic, but again, it was suppressed in 1935. And we're getting towards the end of all of this description that I was trying to give you. 1935, the weekly holiday is switched from Fridays. People like to take their Fridays off in Muslim countries. But in this country, no. Okay? Friday, it used to be Friday. But now it is switched over to a Sunday. Okay? And also in February 1935, Hagia Sophia is switched to a museum after being closed down for some time. There was also an attempt to take all mosques and switch the system of prayer within mosques as well. So it's a whole new religion altogether, okay? So what they would do now is instead of having the type of salah that we pray and we all are used to, there would be chairs of people sitting in the masjid, okay? And there's a person reading the Quran and behind him is a musician playing music. Okay, so the Qur'an is being played along with music like a song, kind of like you hear the same sort of singing in churches as well. So there's this uh, you know, tendency of trying to Christianize uh, this particular country as well. And in 1940, atheism was now officially taught within the country. Okay, this was basically some of what happened at the fall of the Caliphate. Why am I telling you all this? Because in order for you to understand the rest of the life of Badi Zaman, you have to know what happened. Why was he doing what he did hereafter? Everything prior to this from the life of Badi Zaman was known as the period or the time which is the Sa'id al Qadim, the old Sa'id. The Sa'id who was involved a little bit in politics. The Sa'id who was involved a little bit in, uh, you know, he was sometimes part of. He was part of a battalion that was trying to resist the Russian occupation. He was also part of the clergy that was trying to protect the Ottoman Empire from falling to the prey to the plans of the British, even though he wasn't able to successfully do that. But remember, one of the things that marked the goal of his life was the statement that he had read of Sir William, right? That we have to get rid of the Qur'an out of the hands of these people. He realized at that moment that the only way he can now revive Islam within these people who are being forced to leave Islam, literally forced to... There was all attempts to make Turkey that we see today to be the strongest Muslim country perhaps, that this country would no longer be considered a Muslim country. Okay, there was all sorts of attempts to try this. One of the reasons why we see Islam in Turkey today is because of Saeed's efforts from this point till the end of his life. He starts inside of a cave and he starts writing what are known as Rasail al-Nur. These treaties, these books, these small books in, in which he hopes to enlighten people's lives with nur of Iman. He says, this is not the time of Sufism, this is not the time of this, that, the other. He started saying, this is not the time of anything except Iman. We just have to ensure that people in this world that we're living in, in this radical version of secularism that is all around us, they are simply able to maintain their faith. So he writes a letter after another. I'm going to call uh, the rasail letters instead of treaties. It's a harder word, so everybody stays with me, okay? So for the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to call them letters. So he writes these letters after letters after letters, which are basically small books. One of those letters that he writes is a letter by the name of of course, from this point onwards, Saeed will be jailed repeatedly as well. Because the secularists, they felt that Saeed and Nursi was like a thorn in their throats. They couldn't secularize the country with the existence of Saeed and Nursi. And somehow they could not kill him as well. Somehow. Every single time, you know, he was, there was attempted murders of him. He was poisoned multiple times, but Allah kept him alive. Okay? 
Somehow, every time they would try to assassinate this man, Allah would keep him alive. And through him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept alive Islam as well within this country. So the first thing he wants to do is he wants to prove Sir William, William wrong. Because at that time, the Qur'an is being stripped out of the hands of the people. So he wants to teach him or tell him and tell all of the world that the Qur'an is an inextinguishable light, right? It's a sun that can never be extinguished. So he takes simple verses of the Qur'an that are related to faith, that are related to the hereafter. One of those verse, one of those rasail that he writes is a risala known as Risalatul Hashr. Okay? Risalatul Hashr. Again, all of these are available in English, so you can read them as well. Risalatul Hashr. Risalatul Hashr is written at a time, Risala of Resurrection. And by the way, our course will be a little bit about this anyways. But not, not related to this. I'm not going to speak about any of this in the course. Risalatul Hashr is a risala that he wrote. And in this particular risala, he was trying to combat one of the things that Ankara was discussing at that time. How do we bring these people to disbelief? They've been believing for so long. The secularists who disbelieve in Allah already themselves, they're thinking, how do we make all these Muslims, millions of people, disbelievers? So they say, we're going to talk about Allah Azza wa But they said, when we talk about Allah, they're going to get us. That's a red line for Muslims, we can't talk about Allah. Muhammad, these people love Rasulullah, we can't talk about Rasulullah. So let's go for the hereafter. Let's say that, look guys, you all know that people die. If there really was a hereafter, then people would be resurrected and they would come back to life, right? And we would see these people that would come back to life. But since we've never met anyone who's come back from after death, then, then how do we know that there really is an afterlife? So in the simple people of Turkey, at that time, those who had no tools, okay? Because all the tools were stripped of these, uh, from these people. They had one man who had ilm in very large amount committed to his memory, so they couldn't strip, to, strip him of all that, right? So what they did is they started spreading these doubts everywhere. So he writes his famous book called Risalatul Hashr. The treaties or the, the letter related to the resurrection and the day of judgment. And really, it is a very beautiful letter. Again, you can go ahead and pick these up and read them on your own. Okay? And a very logical and a way which is personable to regular individuals. And he even mentions, I'm only talking to the regular people. I'm not going to bring all this, you know, uh, academic gymnastics into here. Even though he could. He's memorized some serious books. But he doesn't do any of that. He uses simple language, simple logic to try to revive faith within these people. This book alone became so popular, right? And, and, and you know about popular videos when you look at the brother over there who works with all those, right? This book here was circulated. Look at this. Circulated all around the country 500,000 times. 500,000 copies of this were circulated. And remember, his books were not permitted in printing presses. Why? Because he was still using Arabic letters. Only Latin letters could be printed in, legally in the country. So all of, his all of the 500,000 copies were hand copied by different people who wished to keep the, a copy of this within their house. 500,000 copies around the country. And of course, each copy comes with an entire family to read it, right? So this word spread like wildfire that this Risalatul Hashr has destroyed the doubts that are coming from the secularists. Then another idea, again he writes a rebuttal in a small Risala, third one, fourth one, slowly but surely faith-based communities, you know, faith started to become some, perhaps even stronger in this particular version of Turkey than, than, than before. But they are trying to suppress faith by every single means. And for that reason, they will arrest him once, they will arrest him twice, They'll arrest him three times and the arrests will just continue. Uh, but they kept on doing him a favor. He said this as well. He said, every time they would arrest me, they would put me in a different situation. They thought my mind was not going to go with, with, with me, but my mind has everything in it, in it already. Okay? So when he would go into jails, he would convince everybody in the jail to be Muslims, to pray salah, to, you know, come back to Allah Azza wa Jal. When they would send him to 
a city in the north, he would stay there for a couple of years and they thought that they're at peace with him. That entire city and the entire population around that city would start to now slowly come to Iman and faith through these rasail that he's writing. When they, so every time they would send him somewhere, they would put him into exile. They would be in fact doing this man uh, a favor. Thousands and thousands of his books were now in circulation all across the, all across the country. Okay? Until the year, now over these years he went through a lot of trials as I said, jail term after jail term, he was old, he was getting sick as well, he's now uh, 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 arriving at his 60s and 70s, getting old, he's an old man by this time, he died in his early 80s, okay? So, but he, he, he doesn't lose his resolve, <clears throat> he continues throughout the difficulties. If they don't give him food, no problem, he has the food of soul. He continues in the light of Allah Azza wa Jal continues to rise throughout these people until finally in the year 1950, the uh, general elections in Turkey happen. Okay? When the general elections in Turkey happen, now the people's party is no longer the ruling party of Turkey. Okay? Now there's a new party led by a man by the name of uh, Jalal Bayyar and another man by the name of Adnan Mandaris. Mandaris. Now, the, this is a democratic party. And the party is a little bit softer on people, on Muslims, on everybody. And they made all sorts of promises that they're going to make Islam a little bit easier for people to follow because people are sick of all these trials. I mean, they can't read Quran and they're Muslims, they can't, you know, read Arabic, they can't pray Salah, they can't, uh, women can't wear hijab, it's just, uh, there's nothing they can really do, except disbelief, that's the only option. And disbelief, and, and anything related to belief is not taught in schools, atheism becomes a religion, literally the state religion, in some ways, where it's now taught in schools as well, legally. So this is becoming very difficult. Now, by the leave of Allah Azza wa Jal, in all of these years, the faith really did not die within Turkish people. One of those reasons, as I said, one of those reasons, not the only reason, was the movement that Saeed and Nursi had started. Because now it's not just him, it became a movement. His rasail, his books are all over the country. There's pockets of people in every city reading these rasail and nur. Until today, it remains by the way. There's pockets of people reading rasail and nur all across the, the, the country to try to revive their faith and belief in Allah Azza wa And all these doubts that the secularists are bringing, uh, they are now being corrected by these rasail that they're writing. So people are actually becoming stronger believers because they're ge getting the doubts and they're correcting these doubts as well. Right? So some people, not everybody, but some people are becoming very strong believers now. And they're willing to go through the sacrifices of, of the subjugation, even, even if it has to be that, for the sake of maintaining their beliefs. So, as I said, in 1950, however, with all these difficulties, the belief is ripe within the country still. The new government comes in and people vote them in, in very, very large numbers. And the Democratic Party wins. And slowly but surely, a number of different bands are lifted. Not everything, but slowly but surely, because the secularists are really powerful. It's said that Adnan Mandaris didn't used to pray. Wallahu a'lam if he did or not. But this is what they say. He himself <coughs> appeared to be secularist, but he had some sharaf. He was a man of some honor. Okay? You could see that he was slowly trying to correct all of the things that the Kamalists had, had really corrupted within, within this country. He, would slow, he was even trying to use the influence of Turkey as a country to help people in Algeria to try to seek their freedom from the French, to help people in other parts of the world, uh, to try to, you know, uh, correct the situation of the Ummah to, to whatever degree. One of the things that he did is he brought back the Adhan. Others, uh, you know, he started to allow for Islamic schools to now be opened again, the, the Madaris of Al-Imam al khatib the Imam Khatib Madaris, okay? They are now in very large numbers, right? Very large numbers. After the, the President Erdogan took office, they started to, you know, become 
uh, readily available to people. He's a graduate of one of those, those schools himself, the Imam Khatib schools. And they became more and more and more in numbers. Now there's literally millions of students to those schools. Literally, one point, if I'm not mistaken, six million or 1.2 million people, students currently studying in that school, okay? And this is statistics from 2016. So it might be more now. And uh, so he started opening these schools again, these uh, Imam Khatib schools and, or Islamic schools in general. And, uh, but, but he had to be careful because the secularists, the army, there's a lot of dangers that he was, he was working with. Uh, but in reality, despite all of the care that he had given, uh, Adnan Mandaris also, uh, there was a coup done by the People's Party and then he was uh, hung. That's a story on its own. But let's go back to the story of Saeed al-Nursi. During these 10 years in which Adnan and Jalal had office, things became easy. And this was the last moments really of his life as well, the last 10 years of his life. And during these years of his life, though they were easy, they were not extremely easy because there's not just two people running the country, there's lots of people. And uh, things are definitely difficult. He's surveilled even through the last moments of his life. He's literally surveilled as well. They follow his every move, but he's now able to meet his students publicly. He's able to you know, travel from one city to another, and that's what he does. Now all of those pockets that he had created of da'wah all across the country in Turkey, he literally goes to one city, visits them, goes to the next city, stays with them for a few days, you know, visits them, gives them some guidance and so on and so forth and gives some new papers that he's written to his students and, and moves around the country until, as I said, uh, the demise of this great man by the name of Badi'u al-Zaman Sa'id ibn Mirza al-Nursi al-Kurdi al-Turki came in the year 1960 on March 23rd, okay? He died at the age of 83. A man who had literally, literally, been one of the signposts of the remains of Islam within this country that, as you noticed, there was all attempts to secularize, to atheize, if that's even a word, this country so that there's no more religion left, okay? It wasn't a matter of separation of church and state or separation of masjid and state. It was a matter of abolishment of masjid, right? And creation of state. That's what, the, that's what was being attempted. He died in the city of Arruha. Arruha is a city, or Orfa, uh, is a city which was known historically as that. And lots of ulama had come from the city. He died there. He was bur buried. His books, his words, his legacy has now been translated into 50 or 60 different languages, okay? Uh, and that's why I said English is obviously one of those languages <coughs> in which the books of Badi'u Zaman have been, uh, have been translated. But even after his death and even after his burial, the people, par people's party was so afraid of him, so afraid of him, that they didn't stop annoying him and they didn't stop oppressing him even after his death. How so? They were afraid that if his body is kept in a specific known location, it will remind people of his legacy and other people will rise to the similar effect. So, after the coup against the democratic government, which was slowly trying to ease the difficulties on people who were followers of Islam, okay, after the coup, the People's Party, they ended up sending or if not the People's Party, the people who have been after Saeed and Nursi throughout his life, which was really the People's Party, okay, they sent a group of people to, to dig up his grave on July 12th, just a few months after his death, 1960, and they dug this grave up and they brought the grave, uh, they brought the corpse and they moved it to another city altogether. And till today, the location of the burial of Saeed al Nursi is not known, okay, to people. But nonetheless, the legacy of Saeed al Nursi is embodied in 6,000 pages of writings that he has written. Most of it is related to the Quran, okay? Because he was trying to prove that the light of the Quran is unextinguishable, inextinguishable, it cannot be extinguished. So he wrote, he wrote 
passages and tafaseer related to certain specific select ayat related to the day of judgment, related to people being resurrected on the day of judgment, related to all of the doubts, related to hijab, related to prayer, related to all of the doubts that the secularists were raising around and about Islam. And by the leave of Allah Azza wa Jal, that iman that he tried to, to maintain, we see today is only growing and growing. Uh, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to take lesson from his life. And the reason why I describe this life is because of a couple of things. A, you see a man who has a vision. He recognizes what he has to do with his life. He sees a problem within the ummah and he knows he's going to solve it. So what we have to do is we have to place for ourselves a vision so we know exactly what we're going to be doing in the future days. You see a man that is willing to sacrifice some things because he's farsighted. You see, there was a lot of revolutions that occurred at that time when faith is being suppressed. He was farsighted. He realized that faith, nothing can stand in the way of faith. Right? Do not become weakened and don't be sad because you will always have the upper hand if you are true believers. He realized that the upper hand will always be for belief. So he dedicated the second entire part of his life despite the fact that he was given offers. I mean, he was a scholar of the Ummah. Mustafa Sabri, Shaykh al-Islam himself had moved over to where? He'd moved over to Egypt because they were killing scholars after scholars. So there was a danger that he would also be executed or killed. The Shaykh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire. He moved to Egypt and, and he did great things in his life as well. And he was given these offers as well as a scholar, a famous scholar of his time. But he chose to live a life of difficulty so that he may be able to maintain the uh, faith. And he had said a statement and I will say it to you and I'll leave you off with it. In one of the court hearings, and that was a court hearing after the revolution of Saeed, Sheikh Saeed, the other one. When he was he was acquitted from all charges because he wasn't involved in it. Most of the times he was acquitted because he was involved in nothing. They were just trying to... And almost all times he was acquitted because they were just trying to place pressures on him to stop. Poison him and all sorts of things, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would protect him. They asked him that, would you wish for the sharia to come into this particular country as well? He said, if I had a thousand souls, if I had a thousand souls, and somebody told me that you sacrifice these thousand souls for one law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be reinstated within this land, which was a Muslim land for, for centuries, I would be willing to sacrifice those thousand souls for the sake of that. So we should be willing to sacrifice ourselves really for Allah azza wa jal to spread this beautiful message because wallahi it didn't come to us on... Ch you know, cheap slates, it came to us on the lives of people and on the backs of people. I leave you with this. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. If there's any questions, inshallah, I can take them now. So this is a good question. Um, the question is that with the onslaught of uh, foreign dominant cultures within Muslims, uh, do we have to necessarily adopt to these uh, foreign cultures, or should we continue to maintain whatever whatever our culture dictates as well, whatever Islamic culture, so to speak, dictates, right? Now, the, whenever the word Islamic is added to something, right, there is really uh, only those things which are encouraged by the deen of Allah, okay? So there are certain things that are encouraged clear-cut by the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal. Other things, they are not really clearly encouraged by Allah Azza wa Jal or His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they kind of became part of the Muslim legacy, okay? Or they have been encouraged, but not so directly. For example, the thobe, there's no passage in the sunnah which says you have to or you should wear a thobe, okay? But there is the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is said to have worn al-qamis. Kana ahabbu thiyabi ila Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yalbathuhu al-qamis. That the most beloved of clothes to the Prophet sallallahu that he would wear is al-qamis. And we know that al-qamis is basically something that has a hole for the neck to go through. That's the first thing. 
The second thing is that it has two sleeves. And the third thing is that it covers the awrah. Okay? So it's not the shalwar kameez then. I know some people like to translate it like that. Because if without a shalwar, your awrah would be showing. Right? So it has to be a kameez which would actually cover your awrah. That would be then, the closest thing to that would be the uh, kameez which I see most many of the people wearing the, uh, the qumsan over here. Right? The qumus. So, that's, that's the qameez. This is what the Prophet ﷺ used to love. Do we have to wear it? Uh, some scholars, they said, there's no encouragement or even obligation. There's no obligation, let alone an encouragement. Or there's no encouragement, let alone an ob obligation to wear such a thing. But others, they said that the Prophet loved it. Okay? So loving what the Prophet ﷺ loved, definitely insha'Allah ta'ala will earn you points with Allah Azza wa Jalla. That's the discussion related to that. So it's really something that is a, a gray area. But what's happening here is not a matter of, you know, little things that, that can be adjusted based on the person's local culture, right? So for instance, the type of clothes that people will wear in, in Malaysia, for example, that's where I'm coming from right now, okay? is much different than the type of clothes that perhaps people will be wearing in Saudi Arabia or the Emirates or Qatar or Oman even. Every place has their own you know, different touch to uh, wears or clothes which are kind of Islamic. Do we have to maintain that? I encourage that people maintain their identities. Okay? Because identity, th when you start adopting foreign identities, you're slowly being colonized in a way where you don't even realize, right? And that's why Mustafa Sadiq al-Rafi'i in his book, uh, in one of his books, he said about language. He said that when people adopt a different language, they have been, and they forget the previous language that they used to speak, then they've been colonized without any weapons, without any armies, without any, anything else. Why? Because they cannot connect themselves to their past. Listen to me. They can't connect to the, themselves to what? Their past. They can't paint their own future as well. Why? Because no matter how good your language becomes, at the end of the day, the language you thought was a language you should be adopting within your life, those who are native speakers of that language, the information that they circulate will always look more pleasant to you. Right? So you can't ever, you know, connect yourself to the past and you cannot also uh, know anything about, you can't paint your own future, rather you allow other people to paint your future as well. Uh, and you won't have a personal identity as well. This is what he said. And, and that's why I encourage in terms of clothing, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, everything, that a person maintains their local social cultures, whatever those are. Especially if they are from a Muslim land, then to encourage uh, maintaining that, that Muslim identity as much as possible and whenever possible. Number two, I also encourage as much as possible, learn and teach English in Arabic. Learn and teach Arabic as much as possible. Teach it to your children. Nowadays, really, for those of you who are just becoming parents, right? It's really easy to teach now children Arabic. By Allah, it's very easy. I know many, many parents who were keen on this. They didn't have to make much effort. They didn't have to travel to different countries. They didn't do, have to do anything because now there's so many resources. If they're going to be sitting at home wa watching cartoons, let them watch Arabic cartoons instead. Right? One may say they're not going to understand. They'll slowly pick it up. That's how they pick, picked up, you know, that's how children pick up. Many children today around the world pick up the English language through watching television. Isn't that so? It's so. And that's why in many places around the world you go and meet people, the, the generation which is in the workforce today, they may have a bit of an accent speaking English, but the new generation, they're speaking English perfectly. Why? Because it's so readily available. It wasn't like the previous generation. And that's the same case with Arabic as well. That's the same case with every other language. So you as a father, as a mother, have the opportunity to connect your children to a Muslim culture. How are you going to do that? Through giving them the language of Islam. So that they can be connected to the book of Allah Azza wa Jal in a way where 
perhaps you didn't have the opportunity to do. But for example, Saeed al-Nursi did. And for example, he uh, aspired to teach the world the beauty of this Qur'an and maybe you can have that same sort of aspiration for yourself and your progeny as well. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq to practice and to convey. I hope that answers the question. By the way, I'm not encouraging watching cartoons, but I'm saying that uh, this is... And, and by the way, there's actually a lot of cartoons nowadays as well that can help your kids affiliate themselves with Islam. Really, there is. There is... Uh, cartoons about different uh, sahaba, uh, not sahaba, different conquerors and different uh, scholars and, and, and all sorts of uh, you know historical events that occurred within Islam and so on and so forth. These are available for people to for children to watch. So connect yourself and your children to the language of the Book of Allah Azza wa Jal and also the, the legacy of Islam. Whenever there's no questions, it's either the talk was really good and understood or really bad and nobody understood anything. I hope it was the first one, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan for giving me your time. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.